listening to Hotel Bar Sessions, the podcast where three philosophers sit down at the end of a long conference day to chop it up at the hotel bar, which, as we all know, is where the real philosophy happens. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Hotel Bar Podcasts. Rami just walked over and was asking for our drink order. So, Charles, let me start with you. What are you drinking and what are you ranting and raving about? I don't know the ingredients to it, but I think there's rum and there's lime juice and ginger. But a local restaurant owner who's a friend of mine and my wife's has made a drink named after us. It's called the Charles and Meredith or the or the Meredith and Charles, depending on who's ordering it. (laughs) Depending on your taste. (laughs) Depending on your taste. Um, And it's official, right? It's been off menu for a few months, but now he actually had a new set of menus printed up. And the Charles and Meredith are on the cocktail list. Wow, you're cocktail famous. Cocktail famous. <laughs> so if you're ever in Oberlin, Ohio, and you go to Teeny Thai Restaurant, ask for the Charles and Meredith. So yes, that's what I'm ordering. My rant, and I'm not saying this as a partisan of any type, but I just find it extraordinarily frustrating watching what's taking place at the federal level in the House of Representatives and the Senate. And I hear this, oh, the Democrats are fucking up and the Democrats are doing this or the Democrats are not doing that. And what gets lost in the conversation is that they are actually at war with a party of complete crypto fascist nihilism. And it seems that the Democratic Party's inability to overcome the party of crypto fascist nihilism seems to be all their fault. So that's my first part of my rant. The second part of my rant is that it's not the Democrats who are fucking up. It's Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin. <laughs> Because 48 people within a 50-person caucus and 70% of the American people want these policies, and these two assholes don't. So let's be clear, media. Let's be clear, commentators. Let's be clear, podcasters. It's not the Democrats. It is Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin, whose very public and celebratory relationship with their own corruption and ego is holding back the possibilities of social innovation in this country. They are the poster couple for fuck you, I'm going to enjoy life while the rest of it burns because of my inaction. So, whew, I'm sweating. That's how much I'm ranting. <laughs> <laughs> it just drives me insane. Nothing um, like crypto-fascist nihilism to burn those calories. <laughs> to, to get a man's blood pressure up. <laughs> my rave is, and I apologize because I always make it a little personal, is that my oldest son has applied for his first three college choices. His- <laughs> Top three, Aww. he decided to go early action. And last night, after like literally weeks of helping him to navigate his insecurities and his doubts about this whole overwhelming procedure, last night he sent in his first three applications for, for college. So nice. very proud of him. Aww. Nice. Daddy loves you, Caleb. Daddy loves you very much. We love you too. We love you too, even though we know <laughs> you're not listening. I know, right? <laughs> The language is too rough. I don't let my kids listen to the podcast. (laughs) Your language is too rough. (laughs) Fuck them if they can't take it. (laughs) That's where I am. Thank you. (laughs) And Lee, what are you drinking and what are you ranting and raving about? All right. Well, I'm just going to stick with my usual drink. I'm going to have a Fireball and Diet Coke. My rave this week is heist movies. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, all right, so we're all on board on this one. Yes, I love heist movies, and I didn't realize it was a whole genre until just recently when my partner Cassandra and I were looking for something to watch on a weekend night, and we were like, well, let's think of movies that are like movies we like, and we started naming them off. I'm like, they're all heist movies. We should try to find a heist movie. So uh, two things about heist movies. One is there's a really great new one out on Netflix right now, which is called Army of Thieves. It's absolutely fantastic. But two, I also want to give a shout out to my favorite heist movie of all time, which in almost every way, a a just garbage movie that was created for a streaming platform. But Hurricane Heist is an amazing movie. You'll be shocked to learn that it's about a heist that takes place during a hurricane. Oh, my God. But it is. (laughs) Bury the lead. I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming at all. But it is so fantastic. And I really want to recommend it. Now, here, I'm over here thinking, how can you steal a hurricane? It's impossible. (laughs) 
You've got to be more creative in your imagining, Rick. <laughs> and, yeah, I love Hurricane Heist. Okay, so my rant this week is cancel panic. This is something that I had not been able to put a name to, but the great people over at Pop Culture Happy Hour Podcast, which is one of my favorite podcasts, were talking about The Morning Show, which is streaming on Apple TV. In the first season, it dealt with a storyline that was a not-so-thinly-veiled recreation of the Matt Lauer Me Too moment. And then weirdly, this season and the second season, it seems like they've just completely replaced their entire writer's room and it's turned into this weird cancel panic show. So panic about being canceled. I think that we talked about this earlier with the Dave Chappelle special. And it's a phenomenon that I think that we're seeing a lot now, which is like, oh, my God, you know, people are going to cancel us. Aren't they ridiculous? But, yeah, that's my rant this week. Cancel panic. Can I just add on to that, that no celebrity deserves a living off of us. So, you know, calm the fuck down. You're lucky. <laughs> you're lucky you've gotten our money for this long. You know, I love that. You're right, you don't have the constitutional right to make right. $50 million <laughs> for working for a streaming service. That's not in any of the amendments, as far as I know. <laughs> Matt Lauer, don't call us. <laughs> All right, Rick Lee, what about you? What are you drinking and what are you ranting and raving about this week? Well, uh, this week, as we're recording, the weather has turned a little chilly in Chicago, and I'm in the mood for a stout. I think I'm going to go with a local brewery, Revolution Brewery, and they have a really nice stout that's named after our airport, O'Hare. Really tasty oatmeal stout, aromas of coffee, uh, a little tiny hint of vanilla, it makes you warm from the inside out. My rant and my rave are flip sides of the same coin this week. So I will start with my rave, and that is the technology that brings me medieval manuscripts from the Vatican Library to my desktop. <laughs> in high resolution that I could enlarge like 400 times and the clarity is still there. And I don't know if you've ever seen a medieval manuscript, but the handwriting, it, it's a skill to be able to read this and sometimes enlarging it is really helpful. So I love this technology that opens the Vatican Library to everyone around the world. The flip side of that is I'm ranting about email. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hate it. I, I can't deal. <laughs> I, I, to Seconded. All, to all of you who are listening, I'm sorry I haven't replied, and I wish I, I could say I will, but I probably won't. I, I can't. I, some days I open my email, and I see all of the, the things in my inbox, and I just close it and go back to bed. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of the things that everybody said when the pandemic started. They're like, oh, now we're finding out that this meeting could be an email. And I'm like, I'm not sure which is worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a meeting or an email. The weird thing is that's how I feel about telephones. Oh. <laughs> so, so everybody who called and I didn't call back, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> right. But the main difference, Charles, between emails and, and phone calls is when I call you, you can look and see my name and you're like, I'm not talking to Rick Lee right now. But email, <laughs> like I'm in your inbox already. It's too late. It's too late. <laughs> I don't have to open it. I don't have to open it. <laughs> delete, delete. Right, delete, delete. Select and delete all. <laughs> All right. So I believe, Lee, you are in the hot seat this week. What are we talking about? So today we're going to be talking about thought experiments. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. 
thought experiments are normally associated with people like us, with people who do philosophy. I sometimes say when we're talking about a thought experiment in my own classrooms, I say, hey, this is just like what you do in a biology class or a chemistry class where you go into the laboratory and you try out some theory using materials, only we're just doing it in our heads with our thoughts. So I really do love thought experiments and I use them a lot in my class. And I think that they have a lot of good and productive use. However, the reason that I actually wanted to pick this up as an episode topic is because there was a recent controversy at Rhodes College, which is a small liberal arts college here in Memphis, Tennessee, because they had invited Peter Singer to speak on pandemic protocols. Now, Peter Singer's views on pandemic protocols are well known. You know, he's for mandating vaccines, mandating masks, etc. That's not the controversy. However, I don't know, in Tennessee, maybe it is. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fair. However, Peter Singer has said a lot of controversial things in his life, some in the course of investigating or elaborating or articulating thought experiments and some just as actual positions of his. But what happened is that both faculty and students objected to Peter Singer being invited because of his views on And this is where it gets difficult because the claim was that Peter Singer advocated the infanticide of disabled babies. Now, before we attribute that position to Peter Singer, there are a lot of caveats to put around that. But nevertheless, there was an honest and earnest deplatforming effort that happened at Rhodes against Peter Singer. I think that one of the things that we really have to talk about is the ways not only that thought experiments are very helpful for clarifying and refining our thinking and our commitments, but also the ways that they can go very wrong. And I think that Peter Singers is a good example of someone who often goes wrong with thought experiments. So today our topic is thought experiments. Lee, I'm going to take a page out of your book. In the early days of our doing this together, whenever there was a topic, you would always come and say, okay, I want to distinguish this from other things like it. And, And so I'm thinking about the vulgarity episode we did, and you were doing the distinction between obscenity, vulgarity, and profanity. And then just plain smuttiness. And (laughs) (laughs) so isn't a thought experiment just an example? Like I put forward a theory and then I say, for example, is every thought experiment an example and vice versa? Is every example a thought experiment? So I think not. I think that the aim of thought experiments is for you to imagine something that is not real in order to either work out a problem that has not occurred yet or work out your position that you might take on a problem that has not occurred yet or work out, as is most obvious in the trolley problem, work out the reasoning that you use to get from the question of a moral dilemma to a solution. I think that in an example... What you're using is an application of an idea that you already have. So I think that examples are applications of ideas, whereas I think thought experiments are places where you create ideas or positions or arguments. So you're saying an example is more like a claim and a thought experiment is more like a speculation. I don't know that I would say that an example is a claim. I think that an example is exemplar of a claim or a position, right? So I might say my position is pro-life. An example of that is that I am against the death penalty. That would be an example of a position that is pro-life. On the other hand, I could say, let's imagine a world in which we could indubitably scientifically determine when life begins. And let's say, just for the sake of argument, that in this imaginary world, it's been determined that life begins at conception. In that world, could one be both anti-abortion and pro-death penalty? Could you have a coherent pro-life position in a world like that? So for me, there are two points here to what constitutes a thought experiment. One is that it has to depict a situation, a scenario, 
or a world that is possible no matter how unlikely. Because if it's impossible, then why are we even talking about it? So I can't have a thought experiment in which all circles are also squares. There has to be possibility no matter how unlikely. And then the second thing is that in the example you gave, and I think this is also the case maybe with the trolley problem to a certain extent, is that it distills down what are the most relevant features of your theory. And so it tries to cut the chaff off, off the wheat. And so, like, is the moment of life important for a pro-life position? Maybe, in fact, whether something is alive or not isn't even the most relevant thing for a pro-life position. But through thought experiments, we could figure out what are the most relevant features to a particular theory. So it's a distillation. Yeah. Is that a way of thinking about it? I think that's a really good way to think about it. I often say to my students that thought experiments are very helpful exercises in refining your thinking. So if we could just go back to the Charlie problem for just a second. This is a very famous philosophical thought experiment. It goes like this for those listeners who are not familiar with it. You're standing by a trolley track. There's a trolley coming down the track. It's out of control and it's headed towards five people who are tied to the track. We don't know why. It doesn't matter. Simon Legree escaped from prison. I was going to say Snidely Whiplash is involved for sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the trolley is definitely going to kill these five people if nothing else intervenes. But it just so happens that you're standing beside a lever. And if you pull the lever, the trolley will be redirected onto a second track. So saving the five people. But unfortunately, there is one person who's tied to the second track who will definitely die if the trolley hits them. Now, the basic question is, do you pull the lever or not? But that's not really the point of the trolley problem. The point is not to just flip a coin and say, I would pull the lever or I wouldn't pull the lever, but to be able to give an account justifying or at least explaining your decision, why it's morally right to pull the lever or not to pull the lever. Why this is useful is because it gives people a way of refining their decision-making abilities by being able to give an account of them and why those decisions are the right decision to make. Now, what I think is really interesting is that over the years, there have been all of these variations on the trolley problem that have been articulated. So in one, the trolley is headed towards five people. You're standing by a lever. If you pull the lever, it's going to send the trolley off onto another track where it kills one person. But that one person is your mom. Or the trolley is headed towards a track to hit five people, but instead of standing by the track near a lever, you're on a bridge over the track standing by a fat man. This is called the fat man scenario. And if you push the fat man over the bridge, then obviously the fat man will die, but the five people will be saved. And the point here is that when you go through these variations, it gives people who might think that in the first original scenario, it's just an, you know, utilitarians, for example, would say, oh, this is an easy answer. You save the five and you kill the one. And maybe they can give really good moral reasons for doing that. But as you start to introduce these variations, it gives people a, a chance to refine their moral sensibility, their moral reasoning and not just what answer they choose or don't choose. So I think that that is not the case in, for example, examples, right? <laughs> examples just show you an illustration of whatever position you're trying to illustrate or show an exemplar of. I often say that examples are good for applying or practicing concepts Thought experiments are good for creating concepts. So that last part, Lee, is something, frankly, of which I am not convinced. Because <laughs> it, it seems to me that if the trolley problem is a laboratory for working out my, as you put it, moral reasoning and moral sensibilities, in a sense, the concept has to already be on the table. Like, what is that moral reasoning? What counts right. as relevant in that moral reasoning? And the trolley problem doesn't help me decide whether I should be a utilitarian or a communitarian or a deontologist or a virtue ethicist. It just gives me a place to go and plop down my theory and say, this is what you should do. 
I think that's true of you and I and Charles, but I don't think that's true of people unfamiliar with moral theory. I think that for people unfamiliar with moral theory, what it does is it makes evident to you that you do have a logic to the reasoning behind these decisions. And so what I often find in going through the trolley problem with my own students is that, and this is, you know, statistically normal, is that 80% of them answer the first trolley problem as utilitarians and can clearly articulate the basic tenets of utilitarianism. Now, by the way, this is before they've learned anything about utilitarianism. They can clearly articulate the basic tenets of utilitarianism in their explanation of their own moral reasoning to pull the lever. What is interesting is that Then later, when they actually learn the tenets of utilitarianism, learn that this is a moral theory, they can then see that it's not just so easily applied, right? That there are problems with planting your flag on continent utilitarianism Mm. that are going to get you into trouble because given slightly altered versions of the trolley problem or other real world situations, you might say that you're a utilitarian but you're inconsistent in your own moral reasoning. Now, that's not a game changer. Well, it is a game changer. That's not a a game ender, right? Like, I mean, we're all inconsistent moral agents a lot of times, but I think that it's a very important lesson for people to learn when they're talking about moral theories because I think that often people think that they are consistent moral agents and they just aren't. No, no, it just seems to me, and I'm thinking about the mechanics of the thought experiment and going back to the term distillation, is there a such thing as inseparable elements from the basic formulation? Is it possible to hit a point where you're saying, look, okay, you've got these people on the tracks, but I can't think of these people outside of being my mother or being an infant or being whatever. Does that disrupt the possibility of a thought experiment? Or can one still say, well, look, there may be baked in primary elements that make it messier and not as clean as we'd like the thought experiment to be? Well, I think that that there are variations is what makes it messy. If we just gave students the original version of the thought experiment, everybody's going to come down and either say, I'm a utilitarian or, I mean, just to oversimplify this, I'm a deontologist. That would be very simple. But when we see that, again, only in a thought experiment. So I'm not putting my students out there and asking them, kill this person or kill these five people, right? (laughs) Only in a thought experiment. I'm saying, think about, though, but what if we add this variation? Or what if you have to respond to this argument from someone who says, on the contrary, I would pull the lever, I would not pull the lever. That is actually what For me, the primary value of thought experiments are is that you can work through all these things that have IRL, moral, political, social, philosophical importance without killing anyone. (laughs) But let me push back a little bit, taking up, I think, Charles Baton there. It is, in fact, the case that I never meet in the world five people. I don't meet five people. I meet the letter carrier, my next door neighbor, so on and so forth. If it is Donald, Eric, Donald Jr. and Ivanka Trump on the track and on the other track, I don't care who it is. I'm letting them die. Um, and, (laughs) And that's how my experience is. I never meet five people. I meet always those people. And this, I think, was Charles' inseparability thing. I meet those people already in the messiness. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. I mean, let me give you an example. If I were to tweet, people who care about pronouns should go kill themselves. I don't know every person of the literally billions of people who could read that claim and who it could actually affect in real ways. Because you have billions of followers on Twitter. People don't know this about Lee. (laughs) But Lee has billions of followers on Twitter. But, and I don't know all of them as real people. There are people who right? don't have phones. 900 million are bots. But you see what I'm saying, right? Just to choose a much more mundane example. If I say, I'm going to skip ahead in this line. I don't know anybody in that line, right? Like, I don't know them as real people. They're just people. I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, I think there are many cases in our real lives where we make decisions, we're making calculations on the basis of a person as a mostly contentless category. No, but let's say you're in the line at the pharmacy 
and the five people in front of you are like three old women who are on walkers and there's a young dude who seems to be in, in the fittest of health and then there's a middle-aged person with three children who seem to be hungry and they're all whiny and cry. You're making decisions based on that. No, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm not saying that that isn't more often our case is that we're making decisions, interacting with IRL people that have some content. But I thought Rick's claim was I never make decisions that are of any significance on the basis of kind of anonymous people. And I think that's not true, especially now in our online lives. I would say to pick up Rick's baton, clearly, you know, we don't know your 9 million Twitter followers. Billion. <laughs> Billion, I'm sorry. With a B. I'm sorry, because you've got followers. Because I have more than there are on the, humans on the, the planet, right? You've got followers. <laughs> All those rich assholes on Mars already. Yeah, I was going to say Lee is huge on Mars. Really big. (laughs) But even if you don't know the 9 billion followers, you are constructing in your mind, you're giving them certain types of characteristic and you're giving them content in order to begin to make these statements. Because to say, well, anybody who beefs about pronouns should die, you've already said to yourself, because it's this type of person that beefs about pronouns. So you've already constructed who they are before you've made that claim. But as types, right? And so in that case, not as real people. I mean, maybe we just disagree about this, but just to use another example, not thought experiment, but example (laughs) of an instance like this, just last summer, I had, a so at CBU, our summer courses make at five students, right? Like the course will actually happen with five students. This might not be true, but I think that we don't get full pay until eight students or something like that. So if it's between five and eight, your chair is going to write you and say, do you want to teach this course or not? Right? Like I'm making a decision just based on literally a number of students. You know, and I don't know anything about them, but I'm making a decision that will both affect me and will affect them in real ways, just based on the kind of as I say, contentless category of, in this case, student. Yeah, but even with the category of student, there's some presumption of content that you have. I don't think you just think of them as abstract beings and whoever shows up in your class, you will always be like surprised. Oh, I didn't know that Big Bird was coming to my class because <laughs> Big Bird's in the category of student. No, you no, no, of course, of course, like in my actual classes, when I have actual students, I assume that they're all going to come in as not Big Bird. But when in, in, the, in the decision that I just described, but even not Big Bird is content. Not Big Bird is a form of content. And for all you furries out there, it's at Dr. Lee M. Johnson. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, but in the scenario that I just described, there is no content to the student about whom I'm making decisions. It's only the number. It's literally the trolley problem. It's only the number of them. And there's no content in them at all. It's like, are there five or are there eight? And how am I going to make a decision for any number between five and eight? So I guess, again, I'm just trying to say that I disagree with the claim that we always meet people as unique, snowflakey individuals. No, no, no. I absolutely don't think that that's true. No, that's not where I was going. To give an example, not a thought experiment, in an introduction that Marx wrote for the contributions to the critique of political economy, He takes on, I think, kind of this problem where he says, if you look at someone like Adam Smith, he thinks that in order to analyze value, we have to begin with something that's really concrete. And for Smith, that's population. And Marx's point is, there's no such thing as a population. Because you're talking about an abstract nothingness that doesn't exist, unless you're already talking about a classed population. And that means a a population in which there's a certain division of labor. And and that means a population in which there's a certain gender division. And although Marx didn't say this, we could also say a racial division and so on. And now none of those are about individuals, right? But I'm a little bit worried about an absolutely empty category that is just human, about which I don't even know how to make any moral decisions. I think that's a fair complaint. And maybe let me say this as a kind of clarification. So In the example that I just gave about trying to decide whether to teach a summer class that has seven students, I think that it's not an absolutely empty category, right? It's students. And there are lots of ways that that could be filled out practically, IRL, in material life, that might change my decision. 
But in the actual thought experiment, in this case, it's not a thought experiment because I'm actually having to make a decision, but whatever. In the thought experiment, I'm only given that category. So as you just said, which I think is right, that there are no populations. There are always populations that are qua populations characterized in some way. They have some content, even if it's just typical Nevertheless, I think one of the really great things about thought experiments is that even deciding how am I going to think about the five people on the tracks, I'm going to make a decision assuming something about those people and something about the one on the other track. And maybe I can't articulate it and most people can't. But yes, no one can imagine five completely contentless people you know, at least they have the content of people who could die. And that's something that's significant to you. But I do think that the great thing about thought experiments, just to use an example that I sometimes use in my classroom, if I said you're in X neighborhood where there's a trolley running down the track. So a neighborhood that would indicate to students something about the content of the people who might be on the tracks. Although, of course, there's nothing that that trolley track being in that neighborhood should indicate about the people on the tracks, because why the fuck would people be on the tracks anyway? You know, whatever. Snidely you know. whiplash. Simon but the I Green. Think that, <laughs> right, but I think that there are all kinds of ways that you can suggest content to the people on the tracks or explicitly articulate content, which is what happens in one variation of the trolley problem where you say, okay, the one person is your mom or somebody that you love if you don't love your mom. There are ways that you can do that. But again, all of these are helpful in elucidating both your moral reasoning and also the kinds of prejudices or preformed ideas that you have given certain scenarios, etc. So I think that one of the great things about thought experiments is that they not only refine and give you the opportunity to articulate your moral reasoning, but also quite often show you the prejudicial inclinations that you have in the way that you're thinking. And finally, sorry, like I, I feel like I'm, I'm doing the PSA for thought experiments, <laughs> but, like, but, but finally... <laughs> the truth is, is that it's extremely unlikely that any of us are ever going to encounter the trolley problem. However, as I tell my students all the time, you don't want to be standing by the tracks when the trolley problem is happening and that be the first time you're thinking about how you make a moral decision. That is my real PSA for thought experiments, is that they give you a chance to work this stuff out before you find yourself in a situation in the real world with real people who might really die and have to say, wait a minute, who would have ever thought this was going to happen? <laughs> Hey, we couldn't hear you while you were shouting into your headphones. So if you have feedback or suggestions for future topics, or if you just want to pick a fight with one of our co-hosts, or in fact all of us, just visit us at www.hotelbarpodcast.com and click on the interactive page. We're there often to solicit listeners' feedback on past episodes and contributions for upcoming episodes. If you want to belly up to the bar with us, at least virtually, you can always email the audio clip, keep it under two minutes please, to hotelbarpodcast at gmail.com. If it's interesting, we're going to steal it from you. If it's not, we'll send you our Venmo handles and you can virtually buy us a drink. <laughs> Those are actually really good points that you're making, Lee, but I, I can't extract myself from this question of what does this look like when it gets messy? Because things get messy yeah. on the ground if we're going to think about it in a philosophical way. And I keep thinking about the types of thought experiments that really lead to some very problematic situations and ways of thinking about it. I think certainly one of those is right going back to the incident with philosopher Peter Singer at Rhodes and his various public claims about people with various types of challenges or infants with challenges, and the response that he received from members of that community, students and faculty from the roads. And it seems to me that trying to work through this smooth and featureless experiment 
have these really powerful effects that I think should be thought through more carefully. And I think it's an important question to ask, well, what happens when these go wrong? Or what, what are the type of circumstances necessary for it not to go wrong? And is that possible? Yeah. And if I could just go ahead and put out there the most problematic thought experiment, I think this is a good time to talk about John Rawls' original position. So this is a sort of classic liberalism account that John Rawls gives where he says, if we could imagine a group of people behind what he calls a veil of ignorance. So they're meeting together to try to establish the laws and the rules of this society that does not yet exist. They don't know anything about who they will be in this society. So they're in this original position behind a veil of ignorance. They don't know what race they are. They don't know what abilities they will have. They don't know what talents they will have, what income they will have, etc. And he says, what kind of laws would those people make behind a veil of ignorance in order to create the most just society? Now, I'm not going to bore our listeners. Like, first of all, go read... Well, or don't. Uh, I was going to say, really? John Rawls' theory of justice. (laughs) But one of the things that many people have rightly criticized John Rawls about is this idea that we could imagine, and this is going back to what Rick was just saying in the earlier segment, sort of contentless agents. So this idea that you could be an actual rational agent that has no content as an IRL person, that you could make decisions purely rationally. And I think that many people have rightly said that if you're talking about questions of justice, if the question before you is how to create a just society, you have to know something about yourself. The justice questions are always questions in which we are individually invested and also invested as groups. So I think that this is where... For example, some thought experiments go wrong. And this is also, by the way, where the armchair philosopher stereotype comes about, where it's like philosophers, they just sit in their chair and they imagine these worlds that have no bearing on reality and they do not care how this actually works out, IRL. And so I completely agree with you. I think that they can go wrong, but I don't think that that's characteristic of thought experiments as such. But can I go back to a point I made earlier, drawing out, Lee, from your distinction between thought experiment and example, we got to this issue of possibility, which led me to start thinking about possible worlds, either the ontology of possible worlds or the logical semantics of of possible worlds. In which case, one way that a certain kind of philosopher might approach the questions that you're saying thought experiments bring up is to ask, is it the case that a moral theory has to be valid in all possible worlds? Or is really what we're talking about is what is just in the actual world we have? And I could imagine another world that is a possible world in which I would give up the rules of justice I have or the ethical principles by which I live my life. And when we get to this kind of Charles used the word earlier distillation and there's a kind of purity that I think has to go on in a thought experiment. Right. And I think that's what they're designed to do is to get us out of the messiness But what if the ethical point, and here maybe I'm just repeating something Aristotle says, what if the ethical point is the world is fucking messy and there really are no ethical dilemmas in a pure world? There's only ethical dilemmas in this really messed up world. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Just to go back to your original question, I think that it is important that moral theories maybe not hold true in all possible worlds, but they have to hold true in worlds other than the world as it is. And that's because even if we don't live in the best possible world, we certainly don't live in the last possible world. The world is always changing, right? So any moral theory that says this works in this world as it is right now is a more or less useless moral theory. Or or it assumes that no change is happening, which means that it either assumes that it is existing in the best possible world or the last possible world. And I think that neither of those things are true. So I think that, yes, moral theories have to imagine other possible worlds, even though we might say that the strength of one particular moral theory over another 
doesn't necessitate that it be better in all possible worlds, but that it be better in our world and possible worlds that are closely adjacent to our actual world. Well, and there you come upon what I think is, I, I never thought of this before, but maybe the only universally valid moral principle in all possible worlds, namely, always act in such a way that you don't make this the last of all possible worlds. Oh, wow. Yeah, or always act in such a way that you don't assume that this is the best of all possible Oof. worlds. Oh, I like that. I like that. Well, I, thank I, you. That's why I have nine billion followers. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm big in the possible world. She's, she, she's big in Mars. And possible Mars. And possible Mars. Not so big in Battle Geese, though. The, the Battle Geeseans aren't quite there yet. But as you were saying this, I was thinking, going back to this question of justice and the materiality of it, the particularity of it, also part of what the thought experiment should do is help us to realize what an ideal self would be outside of just this mental way of clarifying and elucidating one's belief system or being able to construct valid arguments for the decision one may make, I think is also partly an aspirational feature. Yeah, I think that's characteristic of Rawls' original position. I think that's also characteristic of the entire Platonic project, right? Is that in order to see justice realized in this world, we have to know what the form of justice is in order to be able to identify what is just and what is unjust. We have to get behind the real world, the experiential moving material world to the realm of ideas, forms or concepts. That is one form of thought experiment. But I do actually think that there are other forms of thought experiments, which are just about imagining compossible worlds. And for me, it's easy to identify the problems with the Rawlsian project, perfect worlds that are static in which theory works out perfectly. But I think that there are lots of compossible worlds that we can imagine for thought experiments that also go wrong. I think this is where, just to get back to Peter Singer, we run into the kinds of problems that Peter Singer runs into. So l let me just say that in Peter Singer's argument that many people find problems with, he does not actually advocate the infanticide of babies with disabilities. What he says is, and this is a classic utilitarian argument, is that if we were trying to imagine whether we should choose for a baby a life that would include a lot of pain or a death, that it would be better to choose a death. He also subsequently says in many interviews, that is not a prescriptive claim for him. He says, that's what I would do. And I would do it because I'm a utilitarian. And these are the kinds of ideas that I have about what a life with severe disabilities would look like. And it is very important also to note that Peter Singer is not talking about disabilities in the way that we talk about disabilities now. This is an old article. He's talking about a life that would be almost entirely dominated by pain. And he says, if I had a child whose life would be almost entirely dominated by pain, and I had a choice to, in his words, save that child from that life of pain or force that child to endure that life of pain, I would choose the former. Now, I am not trying to be a singer apologist on this. I'm just trying to clarify his argument. Right. Nevertheless, it is inevitably the case, like who didn't see this from 10 miles away, that what was coming was that the way that argument was going to be received was that, and part of this is correct, that he devalues lives of people with disabilities. That part is at least partially true, that right, like the way that he's thinking about what it would mean to be born with a disability is a life of almost uninterrupted pain, okay, so, which many people with disabilities would say is not the case. But we should have seen that the sausage that came out at the end was this position that was prescriptively claiming that infanticide for disabled babies is justified. Now, my guess is that many parents who would 100% disavow the claim infanticide for disabled infants is justified if they found themselves in a situation where they had a newborn baby who was given two weeks, six months, two years to live and the doctors explained to them that their lives would be almost entirely miserable Many parents would very seriously think about removing life support 
And I think that that is the argument that Peter Singer has also made in trying to clarify his position. But the point here is like, where do you thought experiments go wrong? I think this is one where we see a lot of problems with thought experiments going wrong. Well, I think one of the reasons why it goes wrong is because it does not maintain the veneer of abstraction. Because this is the decision that people are making every day. This really strikes close to home and it loses a certain degree of, I'm going to say fantasy because that's not the word. It loses a certain degree of abstraction. Right. And now it's no longer a thought experiment, but now this is very close to being a prescriptive statement about how people should deal with infants or fetuses with certain types of disabilities or challenges. So I, I think that's where it loses the possibility of simply being a laboratory for experiment. But now this becomes like, oh, this is brushing up against policy. This is brushing up against something, an ought yeah. instead of a what if. Yeah. <laughs> Hey listeners, before we have too many drinks and it slips my mind, if you can't catch us at the Hotel Bar, you can catch us on Twitter at Hotel Bar Podcast. You can also follow our HBS hosts individually on Twitter to catch their off-air thoughts. You can follow Charles at at C underscore F Peterson. And Peterson is with an O, not an E. O, not an E. Rick is at at Rick Lee Philos. That's Rick Lee with two E's and Philo spelled like half of the word philosophy. And Lee is at Dr. Lee M. Johnson. The doctor's abbreviated and Lee spelled L-E-I-G-H. In the off chance that you weren't furiously scribbling notes just in, you can also visit our website at www.hotelbarpodcast.com and find everything you need to know there. Now, back to our conversation. <laughs> I, I think I finally have a handle on one of my worries about the ways in which thought experiments can go wrong, and that is that in an, in an important way, in order to be valid, they have to, I was saying, be contentless. Abstract is a word Charles used, but my worry is that, in fact, what seems like the lack of content or the abstraction is in fact, in reality, an unmarked signifier. You know, so Rawls' original position is not universal. It is not abstract. It is not contentless. It's a white dude like me. And with, with not being said, then the thought experiment can take off into all sorts of bizarre directions. So that's one side of the issue. But I think related to this is that we've kind of left aside two of the classic thought experiments in the history of philosophy, one perhaps not so famous, Kant brings up that an ancient Greek philosopher poses the question, if you had a choice before you were born to be born at all, would you choose to be born or not? And Kant picks this up and he kind of answers it by saying, no rational human would choose to be born. And so it's the parents' role to reconcile all of us to the fact that we live in this world. So that's one th thought experiment, and it's not unrelated to the other greatest thought experiment of all time, namely Descartes' meditations. Well, what if these are just hats and coats walking exactly. by? Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. What if these were robots? Yeah. Or the Matrix. Yeah. Right. Can I just add one more that's also related to yeah. this, which is in Kant's third critique, where he says, what if the bird song that you hear is just a dude whistling. Right. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, I, th I think that you're getting at something really important here. It's like all what if questions are thought experiments. Right. Right. Sure. There is another one that Kant uses at the beginning of the metaphysics of morals, namely that a lot of these questions of duty and therefore questions of right would never emerge if I lived alone on an infinite space. Then moral questions probably would never arise. But in all of these cases, what the thought experiment seems to demand, but also at the same time produces, is a solitary individual who has no social connection, who is not gendered, who is not raced, who is not classed. And I think that in a strange way, Descartes tells the lie about the purity of the thought experiment by saying that I'm sitting here in my dressing gown by the fire. 
Well, I mean, you're a grown ass man. Why don't you get dressed? Like, don't you have a job, <laughs> sir? Do you not have a job? It's meditating. There, I think, is where the purity of the construction of the experiment is called into question, and therefore the purity of the outcome of the experiment is called into question. So I think the way in which all of these go wrong is by not taking on the implication of both the one constructing the experiment, the the players within the experiment itself, the characters in the drama, and so on, I think all of these can get out of hand really quickly. I do want to say that anytime anyone asks, what if, that there is already a concrete, content-filled individual in that thought experiment, mm. namely the thinker. Right. I think that the job of teaching students that is another job, like is another set of classes that's not about thought experiments, but is about how we understand what now we call situational knowledge or standpoint epistemology. That is very important to teach. Nevertheless, it is important to ask what if questions and to work out things again before we encounter them IRL. I just keep thinking about the examples of, and this has happened a few times, mostly in the South, but not exclusively to the South, where you have elementary school teachers who see themselves as trying to teach about the history of slavery. And they will say to their students, all right, let's pretend you're a slave or let's do some cosplay. And inevitably, if there's an African-American child in the room, that child will be assigned the position of the enslaved. And of course, the white children will be assigned the position of the enslaver. So now we're not talking about some sort of abstract experiment. Now we're not talking about a way to examine ethical dilemmas. Now we're actually reenacting historical roles. And in some cases, reinforcing social positioning at a larger level. We don't know the specifics of each child's class background or financial life or whatever. But in terms of a structural relationship, we are simply reinforcing a certain type of of power relationship between the two under the guise of let's do something to help you understand these positions, historically speaking. I'm so glad you brought that up because, as you know, this is an actual case that happened in Mississippi, which is that an elementary school teacher taught this lesson that was basically imagine you're a slave and assigned roles to their students that were either slave or slave owner. And some parents of African-American students complained that this was an entirely inappropriate lesson to teach in class. Here's where I think that we can maybe separate that out from thought experiments, because I'm not sure that taking an actual historical event and imagining yourself in it is a thought experiment in the same way that the discipline of philosophy customarily thinks of a thought experiment. But there, Lee, is your issue that it's the acting out of this. But clearly, a a philosopher could say, in speaking of a, a question of justice or something like that, imagine you are enslaved. And the plantation yes. owner and, and so on and construct what would then really be a thought experiment. I think even that language still in Mississippi, oh, that still remains a little sloppy. But I agree with you where you're going. I think an instructor or philosopher would say, imagine a condition where one has little to no autonomy over one's body. Imagine a condition where one is kept in a perpetual state of ignorance, where there are laws that don't allow for you to read. Now, imagine that you are a person who enforces these protocols over, you know, I think there are ways to clean it up and make it into a thought experiment. And then you can begin to ask certain types of questions of justice, ethics, so forth and so on. I think that Charles is making a really good point because I think that you could construct a scenario that asked students to imagine something like an enslaved existence and work out the moral implications of that. And I think the benefit of that over saying, let's go back to something that actually happened and just what if you were one of those players in that actual historical situation, that the benefit of the thought experiment properly constructed would be, hopefully, that students themselves would be able to say, oh, I can see the connection between this thought experiment and things that actually happen in my real life or things that actually happen in my history. So I think that those are the benefits of thought experiments. And this is where I think 
again, Charles, you're exactly right to bring up this pretend you were a slave example as not really a good example of a thought experiment, but an exemplar of a thought experiment gone wrong. Of course, the real fear is that you chance upon that one child who's like, I kind of like this idea of having complete control over someone. Yeah. Let me but that's not a chance. That's not even a chance. Like, you're 100% going to land on that child, right? Like, Yeah, that's true. We know because it's an actual historical event. We have actual human history that right. tells us there are these people. But also, even in the way that Charles constructed the thought experiment, what kind of sticks in my craw is that to say... Imagine that there is a person or you are a person who has no autonomy whatsoever, who is kept in a state of ignorance and isolation from any tools that would allow them to understand the world and have critical tools of analyses of their situation and so on, while the actual person who had that very position is trying to imagine anything but that. In other words, the very construction of this as a thought experiment, I get the positive side, but I think what you're looking for is a certain kind of moral empathy. And I think empathy is a messy business when it comes to ethics, because so what then I don't have to be good to anyone for whom I have no empathy. And I think that I want to think about the position of someone who is enslaved who I would now imagine, all they want to imagine is another world. I hear the complaint, and yet still, I think that there's nothing better than thought experiments to explore the limits of a person's empathy. Fair enough. I think it would be helpful for people often to discover the limits of their empathy, and a, a thought experiment, I think, is a really good way to, to do that. <laughs> It seems to me that part of the challenge of thought experiments, and I don't really use them. I'm an example guy. I don't really use them, but it seems to me part of the challenge, if one thinks about creating new thought experiments, there may be just a limited set of possible thought experiments that one can use, and any new or original thought experiments are really just variations on an old theme. Very much like there are only really seven stories, but there may be only four basic types of jokes that can be told, and everything else is just an evolution of that template. So I wonder, can we think of a new type of thought experiment, as opposed to just a new thought experiment? As you were saying that, Charles, one thing that occurred to me, and it's interesting, we've been only looking at thought experiments in the realm of, let's say, normative philosophy writ large. We've not talked about any in natural philosophy or metaphysics, and maybe all of metaphysics is just a thought experiment. I agree with that. <laughs> but when it comes to normative philosophy, I'd be hard pressed to find a thought experiment that is not either a form of the prisoner's dilemma or the trolley problem. Or the original state of Rawls. That's a modified prisoner's dilemma. Is it? Hmm. It's a lack of knowledge problem, which is the way the prisoner's dilemma is often set up. And how would I act in incomplete knowledge? And it, it has an interesting twist, but I think at base, it's how to act on the basis of incomplete knowledge. One thought experiment that's often used in the philosophy of technology that is not a variation on the prisoner's dilemma or the trolley problem is the unfortunately called Chinese room experiment, uh, yeah. which is partially a philosophy of language experiment, but also a investigation into what constitutes understanding. So it's a epistemology experiment and obviously is one thing that's often used to say, like, do, for example, language processing computers actually understand anything at all? Or are they just following a set of rules without But But that th that's interesting because, Lee, you give an example there of a non-normative thought experiment. So another one yeah. would be the, um, what is it called, the, the knowledge problem, you know, where a, a scientist lives in a black and white room with only a black and white television and yet knows everything there is to know about color, what happens when they go outside. I think in epistemology, there's really only one. And I think it is just this what exactly constitutes knowledge dilemma. Although it's secondarily normative in as much as 
how one decides those kinds of thought experiments has to do with setting the normative definition of a consciousness and consequently a person in the moral and political sense. But that goes back to one of my original points, is that the very construction of any thought experiment is already normative. You can't construct it without some yeah. norm of yeah. what's to be expected. Um, are there ways by which that one can achieve the same goal, but without necessarily having to develop the clean room of thought that thought experiments have? Can you still do this and it still have the same power and effect, the laboratory of thought, the sharpening of thought, the attempt to formulate and understand one's moral, ethical, natural science position, but still do it through the clumsiness of experience. Yeah, I mean, I think that you absolutely can do that. That's what we have examples for. And I think that, you know, this is why examples are very good and very useful in a classroom. Nevertheless, I still do want to advocate for what you're calling the clean room of thought sometimes. I think that that also has a real value in many of the same ways, but not exactly the same ways that examples are helpful for sharpening and refining our thought, I think that thought experiments are as well. Yeah. And I don't want to lose sight, Lee, of the point you made all the way at the beginning, namely that thought experiments, sometimes even badly constructed ones, or I shouldn't say badly constructed, thought experiments, even given all the problems that I think, sorry, Lee, but Charles and I have been raising about the clean room of the thought experiment and so on, that I don't want to lose sight of your point that in a way, push to that kind of extreme is really helpful for an individual to find out exactly what is relevant in this position I hold. And what can I give up that I didn't think I could give up, but now, maybe because of the distillation, the purity of this, I now begin to see what really matters in my position, in my moral outlook. Yeah, I also think that the clean room of thought makes room for imagination to play more freely than it does when it's messied by the messiness of life. So one of the examples that I often use in my philosophy and technology class is I ask students, you know, if you could rebuild the Internet how would you rebuild it? Just asking them basic rule, like, you know, one thing that a lot of times comes up is students will say, if I could rebuild the internet, I would make it such that anonymity was not allowed. So you can be anonymous on the internet. Obviously, we know that there are lots of problems with anonymity and also problems with not having the option of anonymity that gives us a chance to talk about all those things. But the advantage of just the what if, just the thought experiment itself is given a clean room of thought to imagine the world otherwise, especially the world as it's not working presently. Well, unfortunately, Rami is giving us last call. That's how Romulus is. What if Rami wasn't named Rami? <laughs> Has anyone asked him his name? I don't remember. What if Rami was a bartender that only shaved himself? <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Rami, I don't know about them, but my stout has been perfect all evening. I've never had to ask you. I'm so happy with your name, your drinks, and your profession. But unfortunately, it's last call. And so we're going to have to say good night. So good night, y'all. I am currently headed back to my clean room of thought, I guess. <laughs> oh, my God. That sounds so creepy. Where I only shave myself. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I'm out. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>